I was asked to talk this evening about what keeps peace workers going. Why do we persist? We have allowed ourselves to tap into, to not repress our deep belief, our deep trust that war must be ended, that war can be ended. We have the audacity to believe and to act on the belief that war is wrong, that this vital institution permeating our society and our world can and should be closed down. Marianne Williamson, who's an author and lecturer, says, war anywhere is an action that threatens peace everywhere. We applaud the Beatles fan who honored John, John Lennon recently by recalling that Lennon defended the idea that we do not have to fight wars. We were horrified when a confused, crippled old man was blown away in gunfire by U.S. troops securing Baghdad in 2003. We are horrified when families are murdered at U.S. checkpoints due to fear, arrogance, and a language barrier. When cultural norms are violated and innocents are killed in night raids, when young soldiers are blown to bits <coughs> or suffer unbelievable injuries. Given the horrors we have witnessed over the past decade, it is not too surprising that James Carroll says we all may be suffering from a kind of societal post-traumatic stress disorder. We resonate with Steve Earle when he sings, even as a war approaches, I believe there will come a day when the lion and the lamb will lie down together in Jerusalem. It is sobering to realize we have spent our lives holding on to this dream of ending war while our country has been high on the military, as Hans Blix has described us. Some of us have been opposing war since World War II, since, since we were in the throes of the nuclear arms race, since the Korean War, where the failure to end it still haunts us, since the war in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, since the Central American Wars and the invasion of Panama, since the war in the Balkans, since the Gulf War and the 1990s sanctions and bombing of Iraq. In this last decade, hopes for ending war were lost in the attack on Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq, and our not so covert attacks in Pakistan and Yemen. We persist because war must be ended. In many ways, we are sheltered from the reality of the wars that are fought in our name. When our Lehigh Valley Peace Coalition recently showed the film, We Think Afghanistan, many of us were struck at how little we know about the daily horrors of that war. Even if most of us have never experienced war directly, we know we are part of our country's war machine. So we persist because the war culture is pervasive and we must resist. We question why young people must face military recruiters at schools. Some of us symbolically or for real resist paying the federal income tax because about 50% of that tax goes to the expense of wars past and present. Our culture welcomes military themed holidays and parades. War stories from senior veterans fill our newspapers. Pledges to the flag and songs celebrating bombs <laughs> bursting in air open our athletic events. Most every day we encounter vestiges of our country's commitment to war. In a strange twist, we can see this large propaganda effort as an affirmation that, as Eisenhower said, people really don't want war. So governments, politicians, military contractors, generals have to create these elaborate schemes to keep the country supportive of these deadly efforts. It has even become common for the pressing non-military issues of the day to play out in the military context. Gays struggle for rights, so a primary arena for the struggle becomes ending don't ask, don't tell in the military. Undocumented immigrants need an avenue to legal status. We don't just acknowledge college degrees in the DREAM Act, we also include military service as an avenue to citizenship, and recruiters celebrate. Climate change is a threat, so the military, ever the richest government body and the biggest consumer of energy, announces plans to spend loads of our tax dollars 
pursuing energy conservation, ignoring the obvious and best conservation effort, ending war. This is the same military that now spends about $400 to, to get just one gallon of fuel to Afghanistan over treacherous supply lines. Imagine what could be done with those fuel dollars for real energy conservation in our homes and community buildings. Then there is the false conundrum. We can't afford to create jobs for infrastructure, child care, or education at home, but we can't cut the military budget because that would put people out of work. A few refresher statistics from the Political Economy Research Institute. One billion dollars of government spending on the military creates 12,000 jobs. That same billion spent on health care, our home weatherization and infrastructure, would give us 18,000 jobs. A billion spent on education would create 25,000 jobs. Spent on mass transit, 27,700 jobs. We persist because there are many very real threats to peace in our world. And it is important that those threats are discussed, understood, and acted against locally as well as nationally and internationally. And here are some of the current threats that haunt me and make me want to act for peace in every way possible. <coughs> Poor villagers in Pakistan now spend their meager resources on sedatives and antidepressants as they try to cope with the buzzing robots, U.S. predator drones sailing through the sky above their homes. In September, the drones attacked 22 times and killed at least 100 people. Drone strikes have quadrupled under President Obama and the military plans to double drone production in 2011. While bridges and schools decay here at home, massive building projects have followed our troops to Iraq and Afghanistan. U.S. bases number around 400 in Afghanistan at this time. Joseph Stiglitz and Linda Bilmes now say their 2008 estimate of $3 trillion as the total cost to the U.S. for our war in Iraq was too low. Two reasons they give are the cost of treating and compensating disabled veterans has been higher than expected. And there are the costs of the might-have-beens. Like, would the federal debt have been so high if not for the Iraq war? Or would the economic crisis have been so severe if not for the war? Robert Wright says income in the U.S. is now more concentrated in fewer hands than it has been in 80 years. The top one-tenth of one percent of U.S. citizens earn as much as the bottom 120 million of us. Maude Barlow, head of Canada's largest public advocacy organization, has reported that the three richest men in the world have more money than the poorest 48 countries. She also says, in 2009, the global unemployed numbered 230 million, the highest ever recorded. And global climate change claims at least 300,000 lives and $125 billion in damages each year. She says, expecting food and water shortages, wealthy countries and global investment pension and hedge funds are buying up land and water, fields and forests in the global south, creating a new wave of invasive colonialism with hot, huge geopolitical ramifications. All these realities and more let us know our love for the world and our fear for the safety of her creatures and her peoples is not misplaced. 